Thank you very much, Miigwech, Tanzi. Merci. Um, so, oh good, they put it up. <laughs> uh, so just to start with the national uh, definition that, um, so in a way the, our paper doesn't really uh, involve this as uh, was brought up earlier in Al's presentation. Uh, they're not really claiming to, these six communities aren't claiming to actually be part of the Métis Nation. They're uh, claiming to be uh, other Métis um, uh, communities. Sorry, I'm trying to get the... So uh, I want to make a comment. Uh, actually, before I get into this, uh, so in the, in the title, there's Emergence of Self-Styled Métis Groups in Atlantic Canada. It's uh, more Daryl LaRue's. I won't be getting into that. His whole book, uh, Distorted Descent, is entirely on, on that. So I'll be looking more at the MNO and new historic Métis communities. Um, I should start out, too, by saying that I'm, I'm in a very um, conflicted position. Because obviously you know, I'm an academic, and uh, my background is in law and political science. I teach in a, in a law faculty. I'm, I'm not a historian. So that's one thing about the reports. We don't get into the archives and that. Uh, it's more of a, a report on, on reports. But I'm also a citizen of the Manitoba Métis Federation. So it's a bit hard for me to pe play my academic role of trying to be as neutral as possible when it's a, a question that I'm uh, personally passionate about. Um, a comment that was made that uh, touches me personally When we talk about suicide of our youth, I was put in a foster home when I was 15 years old. When I was brought to see the social worker, I was told that they had no homes for me. So those youth that are in the hotels in Winnipeg, that could have been me. I have a cousin who committed suicide. And when I see our leaders fighting for, when they're going after those dollars, it's to make sure that those programs get to our people. Because as an academic, I see in the universities that universities don't want to get involved. And so they go with self-identification. If a person says they're Métis, they're Métis. So they're getting dollars that are, our leaders are fighting for, and they're not going to our people. Exactly. And what I see are these white, middle-class people with an Indian ancestor 400 years ago and using that ancestor to claim our monies. This isn't in the report. <laughs> it will be. <laughs> so to, to give a word of caution on the report, so we don't do any of our, uh, our own original research, what we're asked to do is just to evaluate the research that's done in the reports. Um, so uh, one of the words of caution I want to say, in particular with regard, I'm glad that Al talked about it with uh, because if you read the report, we come up with a somewhat negative evaluation in, in regards to Rainy River and uh, um, the Kenora area. But I want to emphasize that it's based on the historical information that's provided in those reports. We didn't do any of our own original research. And as a legal scholar, I'm looking at it, if this evidence were prevented in front, presented in front of a judge, and he were to look at it and say, on the balance of probabilities, is there a Métis community or not, I would say, judging on the information that's in those reports, I would say no. Does that mean there's not a Métis community or Métis communities in the uh, Rainy River and uh, Lake of the Woods area? No, it doesn't. Because uh, in the Rainy River Canary area, it's one of the areas where there's the least amount of historical evidence or historical documentation. There's a lot of the records simply didn't survive the, uh, uh, the fur trade records and things like that. So for people that are uh, from that area and that, I, I'm hoping you won't take it too personally, the conclusions we drew. One of the things in, in all of the reports that's true, no oral history was done. 
So they didn't uh, go talk to anybody in the communities. They didn't, uh, again, in, in the Kenora area, in particular, sorry, in uh, Port Francis, um, the uh, Sunset, Sunset Country uh, Métis Association didn't par participate in the studies either. So there's a lot of gaps there. So just to make sure that we're, we're not, uh, and it's also, we had a couple of weeks to do it. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, it's a draft report. There's a lot of more research that needs to be done. Um, so to, uh, it's a picture of my dad when he, in front of the Manitoba legislature, probably not long before uh, his family left for Vancouver. That's just me about his age, I don't know why. Uh, so I grew up in North Vancouver, what I call a, a Wonder Bread community because it's classic white. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I understand when, um, when Clem was talking about uh, Métis people moving to uh, BC, that's definitely the case. I'm not saying there are historical Métis communities in BC. It's just not the case of my family. They moved out there in about 1940 uh, because of the war. And my grandfather got a, a job building ships and that. Um, but that's my uh, historic communities in St. Eustache, Manitoba. The reason I want to show this on, the, on, the, on your right, that's my uh, grandmother that's sitting down, my father uh, to her uh, left-hand side, and then my uh, great-great-grandmother, Marie-Rose Laroc. So that's my father with Marie-Rose Laroc, who was born in 1865. She was five years old when the provisional government was uh, in power. So what I wanted to point out with that is it's not that far away for a lot of us. My father had a living connection to someone who was alive during the, the Métis resistance. Um, the other thing I want to point out about this in, in terms of ethnogenesis, so is my grandmother, and that's her mother on, the, uh, on your left-hand side. So her parents were Métis. All four of her grandparents were Métis. All eight of her great-grandparents were Métis. At least 11 of her, her uh, 16 uh, great-great-grandparents were Métis. So that's what it meant for me to be Métis. And so when I'm dealing with the situation in the East, and I mention this because it's the case in all of the reports, when they trace what they call these root ancestors, they have one intermarriage with, uh, with a First Nations uh, um, woman there's no more intermarriage with any other uh, indigenous people, and they become a root ancestor of a Métis family. And that's, that's not how we understand ourselves, at least that's not the way I was taught to understand ourselves in, in the West. And this, this is through all of the reports. Um, so just to go over, uh, summarize a little bit of what has been said today, where this map comes from uh, for me, I published an article in uh, Canadian Geographic, and they put this map up. It wasn't what I asked for. What I did not ask for was the fur trade routes. And the reason I didn't ask for that is because we are not fur trade communities. We came out of fur trade communities, but we, came, we became Métis when we took a step away from that. We were no longer reliant on the fur trade economy for, to exist as communities. And that's what happened in the East. They never um, took that extra step where they, they developed an economic niche that was independent of the fur trade. So what happened when the fur trade fell was those communities uh, uh, dispersed basically and some of them did actually come out west and so uh, that's the reason why we do have a connection sometimes with peop uh, people from Sault Ste. Marie and other, where, other places. What I, uh, what I asked them to do was to put up four or five things. One was where did we hunt buffalo? Two was where did we our Red River carts go? Uh, oh, just about the Red River cart because in the east they're claiming they have Red River carts too and it's just, you, but you don't have cereal. So, <laughs> Seriously, though, it's because it's not the cart itself. You'll find carts all over the world in Asia, and that it's. But nowhere do you find it as a national symbol, other than the the, the Métis, the, uh, uh, the Métis nation, and that. Uh, and it's about symbolism. It's not necessarily about the, uh, the 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 use of the thing. It's not like nobody else had one. So the uh, the York boat routes. Uh, and of course, the script uh, d distribution, which has been talked about today. Uh, so when you put, the other thing is our, our, our First Nations relations. We're not related to Mi'kmaq or Coast Salish and that. And if you look at the Prairie Provinces, it's the Cree in the north, and then the Ojibwe in the south. Those are who are first, uh, largely, uh, there's Assiniboine and Dakota and other things as well. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out, again, about 
because in the, you see in Minnesota State, there's a red lake and the um, white uh, earth reserve. There's a lot of Métis that actually settled on those reserves. And you notice that they're just south of Lake of the Woods. But all of this, what I want to do is put it together on the Winnipeg Lake Basin. These are all the waters that drain into Lake Winnipeg and then go through the Hudson's Bay. Because people talk about our land, but where we moved was also determined by the waterways. So you can see that the, the Winnipeg Lake Basin more or less corresponds to our homeland, including parts that, uh, there's Métis in, in North Dakota, of course, in, in the uh, uh, Turtle Mountain Reservation, where they still speak Métis. Um, and just to say that, that what they call the medicine line, we just moved over. We didn't pay any attention to it. Of, of course, uh, after 1818, it became more problematic. Um, so to go to Pauli, so what we were looking at in the report, because these people are claiming to be Métis communities under the Pauli criteria, so I wanted to go over them quickly. There's three criteria, self-identification, ancestral connection, and community acceptance. It's mostly the, the, the second one that we're looking at in the reports. What's interesting is that what's distinct from, uh, or not mentioned, that is mentioned in the Métis Nation self, uh, uh, or I, Métis identification, is uh, being distinct from another Aboriginal people, but in paragraph 10, the Supreme Court of Canada actually does mention that, that being Métis is being a, it refers to distinctive peoples who in addition to their mixed ancestry developed their own customs, ways of life, and recognizable group identities separate from their Indian or Inuit and European forebears. So the court actually does use that as a criteria for being Métis, even though it doesn't mention in the three criteria. Uh, one important thing that I see a lot working at the University of Ottawa, which is right in the midst of things, is that first the claimant must self-identify as a member of a Métis community. So this self-identification should not be of recent vintage. And this is used as a scare tactic sometimes because, of course, people mention the, the 60 scoop in that. So people didn't know they were Métis. They find out later. And you have people in the, Ma in, in the East saying, oh, you're going to get excluded just like, uh, like we're being excluded because you're making a recent vintage claim. It's not the same thing. So you see this scaremongering that's used uh, from people in the East uh, towards some of our own people. Um, welcoming people back home is not the same thing from, uh, as inviting people from a different uh, nation or people. Um, so the most important thing for us in the, when we're looking at the por report is, the, uh, is an objective requirement because, of course, self-identified is purely subjective, uh, showing that, first of all, there's a, a historic Métis community, that there's a still existing uh, Métis community t today, and that there's an ancestral link between the people who live there today and the, and the ancestors who used to live there before. So in other wa words, if, if you have... Um, I don't know, a, a bunch of people, I don't know, use the example of Germany, a bunch of people from, Métis people from Manitoba take a plane and go to Germany, and they say, oh, look, we're a Métis community in Germany. You, you can't do that. <laughs> you have to produce, prove you have an ancestral link to people that were there before. So uh, the reason I mention that is sometimes you do get Métis people in a certain area, but they don't necessarily have an ancestral link to, um, and I mean even Manitoba Métis or, or Northwestern Métis. Um, Important, as I say, membership in a political organization as, in terms of acceptance might be relevant, but it's not a deciding factor. Uh, and because, again, in the East, they tend to create these, uh, their own associations and organizations, and then they decide that, oh, we're a community, uh, and, and they give out uh, membership cards to people as proof of that. So the court is saying that's not sufficient. Um, one of the important things looking at the reports in the, that's in the uh, Pauli case, and it was mentioned several times, is effective control. It's not just whether or not there's Métis people in that area, it's if they were there before a certain date, which the court decided is effective control, which they said is when the Europeans effectively established political and legal control in the area. Um, so again, it, 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 our own point of view might differ, but I'm just saying what the point of view of the courts is gonna be. If a bunch of, of Métis people move into an area after effective control, they're not going to be recognized as having uh, harvesting rights or title. Um, so for my example, myself, that, who grew up in North Vancouver, BC, even if there was a group of Métis living in North Vancouver, 
we wouldn't have any harvesting rights or uh, be able to claim title there. But as was brought up, that doesn't mean I can't come back to Manitoba and enjoy uh, harvesting rights there. Um, uh, just touch on Daniels, because the case that we talk about probably a lot, but people don't mention uh, Daniels. So what Daniels basically said is the word Indian should be interpreted the same way as the word, uh, uh, to mean the same thing as Aboriginal in section 35, meaning that the word Indian includes the, th the three gr groups in section 35. Um, so again, just saying that Aboriginal or Indian should be, have a broad meaning. But when it said this, so it said for, for the purpose of section 9124, in other words, for government services, the first two uh, criteria of Pali still count, so self-identification and historic uh, Métis community. So even if people aren't after uh, harvesting rights or title, through the Daniels decision, they can still argue uh, a right to government services from the federal government. So this would be the case, for example, that would apply to uh, Métis, as was mentioned in the case of British Columbia, for example, that Métis that move out from the prairies would still be considered Métis under the, uh, uh, 9124. Um, I want to jump ahead to terminology because a common problem in all of the reports is, and uh, I know some people find the word half-breed offensive, but I have to throw it around a lot because that's all you're going to find in the historical documentation. You don't find the word Métis unless a document's written in French. The, 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 the word that's constantly used is half-breed. And even as you know, the, the Métis settlements in Alberta were originally called half-breed settlements. The Métis Betterment Act was called the Half-Breed Betterment Act. And so you'll find that word half-breed, and what I, so when you're going into these documents, this is not Métis people writing this. These are government officials or, or uh, fur trade uh, clerks and things. They're not looking for a, a, a new people or anything. They're just recording their daily activities in the, in the fur trade for it. And so the, the, wor the word they use is half-breed. Sometimes it's French half-breed. Um, just to give you an idea of why you can't just immediately translate that word, for even French half-breed, as meaning Métis, if you go to the Sandy Bay First Nation, which is in Treaty 1, if, I was going to click on it and show you that, but it, it, they describe themselves as an Ojibwe French mixed blood community. And they describe their own reserve as a half-breed reserve. Are they Métis? They don't self-identify. They don't meet the first criteria. So you have to be really careful when you go into historical documents and you see expressions like half-breed and, and French half-breed of jumping to the conclusion that the, these are uh, you're in the presence of a Métis community or Métis people. So in, in every one of these reports, pretty much uh, that's what they all do. Uh, and none of them builds a case like, oh, I'm going to use the word half-breed and then, and then look at what it means based on different documents and then at the end come to the conclusion that this might be a Métis community. They immediately jump into using the word Métis for the most part. There's some that are more cautious than others. Um, there's some documents I didn't even include because there was a court case in Mattawa. Uh, because we were asked to look at the reports, I didn't include the analysis of the court case. There was also a 300-page uh, expert witness document that was produced for the uh, Attorney General of Quebec that I didn't use. Uh, so there's a lot of information that's not in this report. Um, but to get into some of the, uh, well, in, in the Mattawa region, for example, the narrative they try to develop is very similar to uh, the Red River Settlement. So they say, oh, 1821, the merger between the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company, because it, it's basically the gas station principle. So what, if the Hudson's Bay Company set up a, a fort on the river, the Northwest Company would come along and set up another fort right across the, the river from it, just like gas companies do. But what happened when there was a merger, of course, one of the forts became uh, superfluous, and so they closed the fort, laid off the employees, and encouraged them to settle in Red, in Red River, as you know. So they try to reproduce this narrative in, in the uh, Mattawa area, where they have retired company employees coming and settling there. Well, they, they couldn't come up with more than six of them. And worse, one of them didn't have any descendants, but he's supposed to be the founder of a Métis lineage. <laughs> Uh, this is how uh, sloppy some of the, this was in the court case more, but, um, uh, and the, uh, they don't settle right in Mattawa, they're sort of in the general area. There's no intermarriage between them. So it's, how does this form a community when these people don't really seem to be interacting? And a lot of the, um, there does seem to be a, a um, what you could call a, a 
mixed and ancestry neighborhood that develops in Mattawa, and this is where the notion of uh, effective control becomes important, it seems to only develop after effective control. So our hypothesis is we're not sure. Um, I, I wanted to get into, uh, so this is important for Eastern Canada especially. The first time that Indian status was defined was in 1850. And if you look at all the, 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 the categories of who qualifies as Indian, it says all persons of Indian blood. It doesn't say you have to be a pure blood. And, and, we're, and we're specifically talking about Quebec, where in 1850 you have missionaries writing letters. This is, is actually in the Daniels decision in the lower, case, uh, lower court decision, where the missionaries are saying, in, uh, like the Mohawks and Akwesasne and uh, Ganawagi, the Wendake, the Wendat and Wendake, the Abenaki that were mentioned earlier, missionaries are writing saying that these people are all, there's not a single pure blood left. Missionaries are writing in French about uh, First Nations whose primary European language is French, who are mixed bloods, who are Catholic. They're French Catholic half breeds, but they're not Metis. And this is one of the problems I have with this quotation where Muriel, when he talks about uh, Metis in Eastern Canada, he specifically mentions that they live in villages. That was the exact word that's used in French, village indien, to talk about a reserve. The other thing is, he, and there's a, there's a bad quote, uh, translation of that. Uh, it doesn't say under the Indian label, it's, it says habit d'Indien, in, in wearing Indian clothes. So it starts sounding very much like Louis Riel is actually talking about the mixed bloods living on reserves in Eastern Canada. Uh, at least that's my interpretation. But e even from then, where are these villages? Who lived in them? Where are they today? That quote from Riel doesn't tell us any of that. And so you can't just use that quote from Riel as proof of anything. You would have to find other things to, uh, to reinforce it. Um, but uh, all persons of Indian blood reputed to belong to particular body tribes interested in such lands. All persons intermarried with any such person. So any European person male or female that's married to a First Nations person becomes an Indian, even if they're pure European. Uh, but you, the key is of residing among them. Uh, all persons residing among such Indians whose parents are on either side. So again, these are people of mixed ancestry. Uh, and fourthly, people who are adopted, which they uh, get rid of in the following year in 1851. 1851, they'll exclude men, European men who marry uh, Indian women will no longer receive status. And then as you know, in 1869 is when the ax comes down and that's when they start saying any, any uh, status woman who marries a non-status man. So that means even if you're a member of an, in, uh, an Indian tribe in the United States and you're coming up to Canada and marry a status woman, she loses her status because you're not a status Indian according to Canadian law, even if you're an, a, a tribal member in the States. So it has nothing to do with your blood quantum or anything like that. It, it just has to do with legal definitions. So what starts happening in, in the uh, Matawa area, we suspect, is that as Algonquin women marry non-Indigenous men or non-status men, they start moving, well, sometimes the men are looking for work in that, so they go to the, into town. Well, if you're an Algonquin woman and you marry a, a white guy and you lose your status and you've got a cousin or a sister living in Matawa, what are you gonna do? You can't live on your reserve anymore. You might go and live with your, close to your sister or your cousin or whatever. And so, the, and so and sometimes you start seeing these mixed ancestry populations developing, but after effective control. And the evidence seems to suggest that they continue to self-identify as Algonquin as well. Uh, and so this is repeated. I, it's hard to uh, get into the minute details of, uh, of everything, but that's generally the, uh, there's some things that are, I think was mentioned before about something about bakeries being sort of a proof of Métis identity. I, I still can't get my mind around that one. Um, there's, uh, so there's, yeah, there's a, I don't know if I should just stop and let you ask questions because it seemed like there's, uh, or if you want to hear more details about the uh, particular communities. But I think those are the, the, general pro the general problems with all these reports is that they systematically take the word half-breed and translate it into Métis. They don't really look into um, what we call uh, endogamy, so you have mixed bloods marrying other mixed bloods. Um, so yeah, but I, w I would enjoy the opportunity to do a lot more in-depth uh, report.
if it were possible. Um, so I think I'll conclude with that and then let you uh, let, take questions more if you want to ask me any questions about any particular communities in the report.